Thanks to Brilliant for supporting my channel. Neuralink's summer 2020 research updates have caused quite a stir. In fact, as someone whose PhD research involves brain-machine interfaces and machine learning, I was certainly curious to see what they had in store for us. From researchers annoyed about not being credited to people who are hoping that this technology will restore their limb function or allow them to replay memories of loved ones, it can be hard to separate the reality of Neuralink's goals and progress from the hype. But today we're gonna to do just that. From the founding of the company to their recent update last week, we're going to talk about Neuralink's goals, progress, and separate the facts of their work from the fiction of the hype. Also, if anyone has read A Beautifully Foolish Endeavor by Hank Green, I'll just say, strong Neuralink vibes. <laughs> Neuralink was founded in 2016 by Elon Musk, who you might know from OpenAI, SpaceX, Tesla, and his often controversial Twitter personality, as well as eight other researchers who are experts in computer science, neuroscience, and hardware development. The company has the short-term goal of developing technologies to cure brain diseases and the long-term goal of human enhancement. Specifically, Musk has said that he is interested in creating technologies that will prevent artificial intelligence, more likely artificial general intelligence, from becoming an existential threat to humanity by creating a symbiotic relationship between AI systems and our brains. In the short term, Neuralink has hosted two events over the last two years to showcase their progress. In July 2019, they proposed a flexible electrode system that could be sewn into the brain in order to minimize tissue damage while optimizing the amount of information that we would be able to read out of the brain. At the time, they'd proposed to connect those flexible electrodes to an external hardware system that would sit just behind your ear to process and transmit neural recordings and receive stimulation commands. The company claimed that these electrodes would be able to stay in your brain for several years and released a preprint that was not peer-reviewed detailing the technical underpinnings of their work. Notably, the preprint was authored by Elon Musk and Neuralink, even though there are about 100 employees at the company. In August 2020, last week at the time of this video's release, Neuralink announced their new device, the Link. The Link is an electrode implant that would sit on top of your head with the electrodes implanted in your brain via surgical robotics, and that could be connected to your phone via Bluetooth to both read information from the brain and stimulate the brain simultaneously. The Link is actually an update on their earlier proposed hardware, which was supposed to sit behind your ear in a much more compact form. It's also much less visible as it would be implanted by removing a small piece of your skull, sewing in those electrodes, placing the device where your skull was, and then sealing the skin over top of it using superglue. And in case anyone's wondering, superglue is actually surprisingly common in surgical procedures. The link has 1,024 electrode channels, and the August presentation showed microscopy data of these electrodes directly activating neurons in the brain of a pig. The August presentation also introduced us to three of Neuralink's subjects. Three pigs, one of whom had not had a device implanted in his head, one of whom had a device currently in its head, and a third who had had the device in its head and then had had it subsequently removed. All three pigs seemed to be in good health and active, and in particular, the second pig, whose name is Gertrude, was fed some snacks so that we could see the real-time activity in her brain as the link device was connected to a part of her brain that is connected to her snout. So in light of these presentations, you might be wondering whether Neuralink has made progress towards their short and long-term goals. And the short answer is yes, but there's a lot of caveats. The Link device combines several existing technologies in a compact design that, in theory, minimizes tissue damage while optimizing recording and stimulations of regions of interest in the brain. The implantation procedure minimizes time under anesthesia and is minimally invasive, ideally minimizing surgical complications that might come of this, and could generally reduce stigma for those who need brain-machine interfaces for their conditions, as much of the current technology is rather obvious. And from these presentations, it would seem that the associated software can help physicians and physical therapists monitor patients in real time and adjust their rehabilitation programming as needed. In addition to using the collected and hopefully anonymized data to conduct further research in neuroscience. Sounds incredible, right? Well, let's talk about the caveats first. The biggest one that I wanna highlight first is that none of these claims have been publicly validated by an external third party. The 2019 presentation included a white paper that was uploaded to Archive, a preprint server that does not do peer review, and the 2020 presentation included minimal technical details and no documentation on the advancements that they reported. 
This isn't to say that Neuralink is making false claims about their work. After all, they are known to be very secretive about it. But it is to say that I would be skeptical of any scientific claim that came without evidence or external validation. Secrecy isn't uncommon in industry research, but even biotech and medical device companies usually publish or provide some sort of validation of their work when they go public with it. In fact, a recent Stat News article interviewed several current and former employees of Neuralink, highlighting a chaotic internal culture that often rushes the scientific process and overstates the company's research, leading to five of the eight original founding scientists leaving the company as well as several employees. Having said that, Neuralink's new Link device was approved by the FDA as a breakthrough device, which means that the FDA has seen some evidence that the Link could provide significantly improved patient outcomes over existing technology. Importantly, breakthrough technologies aren't actually scientific breakthroughs or technological breakthroughs in any way. They're therapies that the FDA believes can treat life-threatening diseases and provide promising results. About a third of the applications that the FDA gets every year for the breakthrough device category get approved, and this designation allows them to start conducting limited human testing. Also, in fairness to the company, Musk said at the beginning of the presentation that this wasn't really intended to be a scientific or fundraising presentation, but a recruiting presentation. So that might be one of the reasons why there is no documentation or external validation of their work as yet. Having said that, I still personally think that some sort of validation or documentation of their work should be released. Next, while Neuralink has made progress in their own internal work, their progress isn't actually as novel as it might seem. In fact, there have been several papers and one patent in the last 15 years demonstrating similar design considerations. I'll include a few examples up here, but one lab in particular patented a very similar system in 2008. Now, most of these older systems can't record from as many channels, usually it's 32 or 64, and more recently it's been up to 100, compared to Neuralink's 1024 channels, and most of them also only do recording, not recording and stimulation. However, I think it's fair to say that prototype link devices have been around for a while, well before Neuralink started working on this. Additionally, while recording from 1024 channels in such a small device is fairly novel, recording from that many channels has been done before, as has simultaneous recording and stimulation. And in case you're wondering, the challenge behind simultaneous recording and stimulation is that the recording inherently picks up the stimulation signals, which often overpower the neural data that you want to collect. Developing a system that can filter out those stimulation signals while preserving the neural signals on such a small device with limited battery power is, well, hard. In short, I would argue that Neuralink's main accomplishment here is creating a compact device that combines several existing technologies in a improved way than previous tech has, and that that work is built on decades of research of other researchers who they fail to credit. On that note, the current updates don't do much to address questions around the possible immune response to implanted electrodes and brain-machine interfaces. Currently, when electrodes are implanted into the brain, the process of implantation can rupture blood vessels which can release toxic proteins that destroy nearby tissues. Additionally, implantation can activate microglia, which are the main cells involved in the brain's inflammatory response. The subsequent inflammatory response usually results in erosion or corrosion of the electrodes themselves, rendering them unable to record more data and potentially damaging nearby tissues due to reactive oxygen species, as well as scarring around the electrodes, which further prevent the acquisition of more data. In the original presentation in 2019, Musk said that these electrodes would last several years, but neither the original presentation nor the recent update nor the white paper include any information on the specifics of how many years, how they arrived at that number, and how their technology sidesteps the neuroinflammatory system. In fairness, the company's only been around for four years, so they haven't had enough time to do those kinds of long-term studies yet, especially not in humans. Another concern is data privacy. The August 2020 presentation proposed Bluetooth LTE as the method of transmitting neural data to and from the Link device, which creates data security concerns. From the presentation and the Q&A, it seems like Neuralink hasn't quite figured out how to deal with that issue yet, and that's only reinforced by the fact that they seem to be hiring for security and encryption experts on their website. As for the claims of melding your mind with artificial intelligence, being able to replay your memories or anything like that, I wouldn't hold your breath on those claims. Doing so would require a much, much better understanding of our brain as well as of AI systems, and I don't see that happening anytime soon. And let me know in the comments if you'd like a more detailed video on why exactly this is so hard. 
Finally, even if this all were to work, it brings up a ton of concerns about the legality and ethics of accessing your neural data or potentially in the future, your thoughts and memories. Just like a Fitbit, which Musk often compares the linked device to, a neural implant and the associated data may or may not be covered under the HIPAA privacy rule which arguably already does a bad job at protecting our medical data right now. After all, what if the FBI wanted Neuralink to create a backdoor entry point to a Neuralink device so that they could interrogate suspects, just as the FBI asked Apple to create a backdoor into iPhones? And how do those concerns affect the way that we think? After all, if you're constantly worried that your thoughts are being monitored, you're going to have to learn to think differently in order to conceal the things that you don't want people to hear, and I'm not sure that's a good thing. Plus, our attention is already a highly valued commodity in the current economy, and I can only imagine that getting worse if companies can pay for a direct line to your brain. It's also important to note that the underlying assumption of this business plan is that people will pay money to have unnecessary brain surgery. Personally, I can't see myself signing up for voluntary brain surgery without a much deeper understanding of how our brains and these devices work, and a lot more studies on people who aren't me. <laughs> For example, LASIK is just now becoming something that the public seems to be a little bit more comfortable with, even though a lot of people wear glasses and LASIK's been around for decades. And I'd argue that brain surgery is higher stakes than vision correction. To wrap things up, while I do think that Neuralink is generally overhyped and that the internal concerns from current and former employees reinforce that, their progress is interesting and innovative. In fact, that's actually why I find the hype so frustrating. They have actually made a really interesting technology here, but it's being overshadowed by claims that we're going to be able to connect our brains to our computers or replay our own memories soon. I actually hope to see them work with more academics in the next couple of years, as there's been a lot of interesting work on brain-machine interfaces and sensory interfaces that facilitate connections in our brain that otherwise aren't normally there. For example, researchers at Baylor College of Medicine are creating the VEST, which stands for Versatile Extrasensory Transducer, that converts speech into vibrations that deaf people can learn to understand. And the BrainPort system lets blind people see the world around them by converting real-time video into tactile stimulation on their tongues. So while we wait for the Neuralink update that can let us connect our brains to our computers for only $9.99 a month, you can get your brain ready by teaching it all about algorithms, machine learning, and quantum computing by taking any of these courses on Brilliant. Brilliant is a website and app that makes learning accessible and fun. As anyone who has watched my videos before knows, I like Brilliant because their approach is based on problem solving and active learning. Instead of passively watching videos, Brilliant's courses are all about seeing concepts visually and interacting with them, and then answering questions that get you to think. You can take courses on anything from intro to neural networks, to quantum computing, to computational biology. In fact, they have courses that cover most of the topics that we've talked about on this channel. Their courses are laid out like a story and are broken down into pieces so that you can tackle them a little bit at a time. There's no tests and no grades, so you don't have to worry about disappointing your brain implant. You can just pick a course based on what you're interested in and get started. And if you make a mistake, no big deal. Just check out the explanations to find out more. To get started, go to brilliant.org Jordan or click on the link in the description to sign up for free. In fact, the first 200 people to click on that link will also get 20% off the annual premium subscription. Clicking that link supports my channel and gives you access to an amazing library of courses, so please check them out. Otherwise, if you like this video, you can let me know by hitting that like button and subscribing to my channel. You can also check out the other videos that I've done on medicine and AI via this playlist. Otherwise, you can follow me on Twitter and Instagram to follow my PhD life, and I will see you guys next Friday. Bye!